From the Atlantic Council's Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security, this is NATO 20 2020, a new podcast series pitching fresh ideas for the world's oldest military alliance. I'm your host, Terry Schultz, and I've been covering NATO a long time, so I know a lot about how it's been doing things, but this series is about how it could be doing things differently. The Atlantic Council commissioned a series of 20 recommendations as to how the 70-year-old alliance could freshen up a bit heading into the next decade. Some of these are ideas we've heard before, and some of them are brand new. All of them are aimed at helping make NATO more responsive and resilient in the face of these threats that are becoming more creative all the time. So I'm digging into those ideas with their authors. In this episode, the recommendation is to revitalize NATO's grand strategy. And the authors are Timo Koster, who was ambassador at large for security policy and cyber in the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs until September 2020. Before that, he was the director for defense policy and capabilities on the NATO international staff, which is where we met years ago. And he is now an ambassadorial fellow at the Atlantic Council. Also writing this uh, recommendation, Ivanka Barzashka. She's the director and founder of the Wargaming Network and a researcher at the Center for Science and Security at King's College London, where she also develops new analytical methods to examine the impacts of disruptive technologies on strategic deterrence. That was a mouthful. Thank you both for joining me. So we'll go right into this. Your paper says NATO needs a grand strategy that draws on all the tools at its disposal, economic, political, diplomatic, as well as military, to counter emerging security threats. Now, I mean, I would guess that NATO considers all of its strategies pretty grand, but you're saying that it needs to do more, that Russia has become more belligerent and China has emerged as a competitor and allies lack a grand strategy to address the current and emerging, emerging challenges together. Um, Now, I I very much want to hear the details of how what NATO is doing now does not qualify as a grand strategy. So whichever of you wants to start, go ahead. So let me start. Uh, First of all, great to be here with Ivanka and and, uh, uh, shedding a light on uh, this series of articles, which is a great project. NATO, of course, has had a strategy for a long time, but uh, for two reasons, we think it's a bit outdated. First of all, the current strategic concept dates from 2010. And if you open that piece of paper, then you will see that, for example, Russia is still identified as a strategic partner. Things have changed in the meantime with uh, Ukraine, with Crimea, and a bunch of other things, and it's time to revamp that strategy. Second difference is, I think, with the enlargement of NATO, it has become more difficult to reach agreement on what that grand strategy should be about. There's not just some controversy between the United States and Europe on defense spending, but on a couple of other things. Also between East and Western Europe, uh, between the South and the North, and then there's Turkey with their own priorities and their own considerations. So. Um, If you don't want that to be a zero-sum game, if you don't want that to be something that is purely based on politics and on regional threat perceptions, you need some new tools and new methods to come to an agreement and to come to something that can actually stand the test of time. Does this not qualify as as a a blueprint for a grand strategy? Did did these not meet your expectations um, now, now that we're talking a little bit? No, it does. Actually, the Reflection Group report is a very good piece of work which very clearly sums up the challenges and possible responses and actually as a matter of fact in that report there's two important uh, uh, recommendations which chime with ours it says nato needs an office of net assessment and secondly nato needs to use war gaming to come to understanding and decision making about what its priorities are in terms of responses to all those new uh, uh, challenges that we see in the world around us. That's a good place for Ivanka to come in because that's her specialty. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Ivanka, up to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we were very glad to see that the Reflection Group report to the Secretary General recommended the development of a, of a new strategic concept. We're also glad to see that our recommendations for a net assessment process and for the use of novel forward looking analytical methods um, like wargaming also made it into that report. Um, 
But when Timo and I wrote the article, uh, this was before the US presidential elections in, in November 2020. And the biggest uncertainty um, for opening up the formal security concept process was uh, formally starting um, what, what was, was US leadership. Um, you know, how would a, a US president view America's role in the world and its relationship with NATO? Um, and President Biden has said America's back. Uh, he's called uh, um, on the United States to rebuild and, and reestablish alliances, starting with NATO. Um, and also, you know, we're starting to see a lot of progress being made in, in this direction with um, uh, the uh, adoption of a, of a NATO warfighting capstone um, a concept. And, and, and we expect that at the, um, at the Brussels summit uh, this, this summer, uh, we'll, we'll see the formal uh, reopening of, of the strategic concept that, that um, uh, w w which is the, the, the purpose of the article that, that um, our article with Timo av advocated for that. Spring, the summit's in spring, isn't it? Don't make it so late as summer. <laughs> Do you have any information? The section is saying later this year. <laughs> no, <laughs> my, my source said summer. <laughs> Has but it slipped from spring? Oh, I didn't notice. Um, anyway, um, okay, that's interesting. Um, at, still, just to go back to this one more time, um, did you, when you wrote this, suspect that, that um, the Secretary General would not update the strategic concept? I mean, is this basically the same kind of recommendation as, as updating that when perhaps he hadn't been clear enough about that yet? No, I, I, I think Ivanka makes an important point. The game changer is the election of Joe Biden as president of the United States. Um, and NATO has been sort of procrastinating a bit when it came to making big decisions whilst uh, President Trump was still in the game, because that was a, a real yeah. um, uh, factor of uncertainty. Actually, the extension of the Secretary General himself twice or three times now is actually part of that uh, part of that game. So, that fact, true, yes. So, so if you look back uh, at recent history, we do a new strategic concept about every decade. So that in itself is not a revolutionary recommendation. It's about time that we do it because some of the new challenges are lacking and some of the old challenges have changed. What we are recommending is that we use different methods for coming to an agreement on that strategic concept, because it's so difficult to get agreement between a very um, uh, a coalition that's spread out both geographically and politically, and that have different regional priorities, different priorities in terms of where they put their resources, et cetera. So if you don't want to make it just sort of a shouting game on um, my priority is bigger than yours, then you might want to look at different uh, decision-making tools. And that's not just to, to agree on a strategic concept, even after that, when uh, we get to other decisions on operations, on the kind of things, you know, uh, uh, prioritizing capability requirements, et cetera. That's something that you want to use sort of continuous. So again, the reflection group rightly says, institute an office of net assessment, which means something that will be there at the disposal of allies for the next 10, 20, 30 years. But perhaps um, Ivanka, again, we can go back to you for explaining how uh, war gaming or some of the other methods that you're talking about help NATO come to decisions because you wrote in the paper that, um, that allies um, regularly agree to kick the can down the road instead of confronting their political differences. So tell me how you've got any way to get out of this. As Timo mentioned, uh, the expansion to 30 um, has brought in um, even more diversity to use a euphemism. Well, so I mean, to be clear, what we're proposing is, is not a new process for making decisions. Uh, those processes are already in place. What we'd like to see is a layer of strategic thinking before that bureaucracy. And, and so what Timo and I propose is, is a new process for what we've called collective strategic analysis, um, which, which involves um, and which gives allies an opportunity to have a way to 
analyze together, to think through together uh, some of the, the toughest security challenges and some of the most divisive issues. Um, so it's, it's, it's not a process for making decisions. Um, it's not a mechanism for deciding what to do or where the priorities should be. Um, this is what comes before. It's the precursor to that formal NATO decision-making process. And, and right now, um, allies do this kind of strategic thinking alone, if, if at all. And, and, and let me offer the example of, of the United States. Um, so the, the National Defense Strategy Commission, which was a bipartisan commission that was tasked to review uh, the Trump administration's defense strategy, um, it published a report in, in 2019 that um, highlighted this atrophy in strategic thinking. Uh, it said uh, America's ability to defend its allies, its partners, um, and its own vital interests uh, are increasingly in doubt. It said national strategy too often rests on questionable assumptions and on weak analysis. Uh, and it said the United States must develop more holistic strategies, um, particularly for, for uh, competitions short of war. And, and so that's the United States. Uh, but what about smaller NATO allies? Uh, you know, many lack the necessary uh, capacity and, and capability to do strategic analysis. And so the solution that we propose is, is this new NATO process for collective strategic analysis. Um, and this isn't just a theoretical proposal. We've made progress on, um, on Timo and I have made progress on developing a practical way uh, to, to do some of these things. And, and I'm, I'm happy to talk uh, about that in, in, in some more detail as well. Oh, based, I'd like to hear it. Uh, oh, based on realistic scenarios. It's, it's not just theoretical. You, you look at realistic scenarios and you think through what that would entail in terms of decision making, in terms of capabilities and, and in terms of posture, et cetera. Well, do give me a practical example and, and walk us through it, um, because, again, I, I, having not been in the room, as you have been, Timo, um, I don't know how this differs from what happens now. And I still don't see how um, you're going to get allies, big or small, um, to not think first about their own national interests. And, and therefore, I don't understand how this is going to help them come to conclusions any differently. Yeah, so, so there's a couple of things that make reaching conclusions at NATO difficult. One is that it's all, always a snapshot in time. What's the most pressing issue at this moment? It might be a, a migration influx in Southern Europe, or it might be a Crimea crisis, etc. So that tends to sort of take the headlines and, and uh, sort of dominate decision making one. So that's that's not a good thing. If you have an alliance that has to cover all those uh, priorities. Secondly, there's always, as we just spoke about, regional differences in threat perceptions, et cetera, and politics play into that. Um, it's also big against small and rich against poor or, or rich against less rich, I, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's generally a rift between the political side and the military side. The political side likes to uh, reach compromises that basically uh, covers all equities and make sure that everyone is happy with a text. Normally, that becomes a text that is very unclear, which makes it very difficult for the military to base their planning assumptions on. If you have another tool, and it's just another tool, it's not like we're going to throw everything out of the window. If you have another tool that produces based on scenario-based decision making on on um, thinking about what your own capabilities are versus what you would like to have which is net assessment and you get a set of let's say uh, I'm, I'm not going to say scientifically uh, um, um, procured data but at least data that's based on a different process you can insert that into a, uh, a decision making process which if hopefully helps the decision making along. So it's, it's, um, it's an extra tool, which hopefully helps us to uh, uh, make decisions about our immediate priorities and about uh, uh, longer term priorities. But wouldn't they already be getting this information through shape or through their own military planners? I mean, is this a gap that has been missing or you're just uh, suggesting that it be given a higher priority? 
it's not new information. The question is, what do you do with that information? How do you look at that information? How do you discuss it? How do you use it to base your assumptions on? Because a lot, a lot of what we do at NATO is, of course, is, is, is compromising based on, well, what I just talked about, not necessarily um, uh, something that is objectively the highest priority. That's very difficult. Well, so just just to build on on what what Timo said um, in, in answer to your question, Terry. You know how how does NATO go about strategy development? How does NATO um, make strategic decisions in in peacetime and in crises? Uh, you know you have uh, different NATO allies come in with with their own um, strategic analysis, so they're they're their own capitals do that um, analysis. They, they inform uh, NATO leaders who then need to come to a consensus. All 30 of them need to come to a consensus on an issue. Um, I mean, the challenge is that, so we you know we talk about net, you know, we, we talked about net assessment, we, that we need net assessment. Um, why, why is that? Um, because now, NATO, um, individual allies and, and collectively as an, as an alliance, um, are being confronted by um, these state competitors, state challengers that are thinking adaptive uh, opponents with, with long-term revisionist strategies. So you, you need to be thinking um, not just about what should I do to react to this immediate issue? You need to be thinking about the long term um, and how do our theories of success align or how do they conflict with, with that opponents, not just today, but, but over the long term. So this is what, what net assessment is about. It's about being able to measure up against these other actors, these, these potential competitors, um, both in peacetime competition, but also uh, if we see escalation to uh, to crisis or, or, or conflict. And right now, it's just the United States that has a net assessment office. Uh, the UK has just recently established this capability and is, is, is still growing it. Uh, some of the work that I've done at King's um, supports that, that office currently. And and you know, what about other allies? Um, they they lack this capability. And, and so then they lack the capability to contribute effectively to, um, you know, with their own informed strategic um, analysis uh, to that collective decision-making. Um, I mean, in, in addition to that, it's not just national perspectives. You need to think about uh, what a, a NATO theory of success looks like. And, and there's no single theory. I mean, we, we're talking about these potential um, future um, ways in which in which events could unfold. So you'd have, you know, maybe, you know, if, if the question is, you know, what is NATO's theory of success for uh, gray zone conflicts with, with nuclear risks? Well, you know, what are the objectives? Um, how should NATO allies, uh, you know, what should NATO allies do to achieve a, a desirable outcome? And, and so the UK government will have one theory, Romania's will have another, and it's better to think through the consequences of these different perspectives uh, now than wait to resolve them during during an actual crisis. So, are you talking only about looking at things that, that have a pretty slow timeline, what, that you can have the time to add this extra layer of analysis, negotiation, compromising? Um, it would be hard to respond to anything on the spur of the moment this way, right? True. It's 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 not a tool that enables an article a decision on an Article Five situation. But look at, for example, the Crimea, the Ukraine crisis, um, and and what followed at NATO. So, uh, 2014, uh, Russia <coughs> first invades and 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 then annex Crimea illegally, and then the response from NATO was actually quite. Um, uh, step by step. That's not something that we did overnight, but it was basically what the market could bear. We didn't want to send massive troops towards the east. If you look at what we decided at the Wales summit initially, it was just about reassurance. 
more air policing in the Baltics, some more uh, exercises on the ground in Eastern Europe. And then only at the Warsaw summit, we came up with a concept, which is again two years, say two years later, which was again what the market could bear, a very limited forward presence in Eastern Europe with the ability to rapidly reinforce. That rapid reinforcement that is supposed to come across the Atlantic and across the European landmass, that again was dependent on something that we now call military mobility, which again took years to build. All of this was step by step, bottom up. There was no new strategy. We didn't reopen the discussion on the overall strategy of NATO. We didn't devise a big uh, military strategy first and then start started filling in the blanks. We actually did it bottom up, bit by bit, about um, uh, the steps that we could politically uh, achieve between then 28 allies. And it worked, at least we haven't been challenged since uh, by Russia, at least not in a sense that they, they tried to uh, tried an incursion into allied territory. Um, but our, if you look back at this six, seven year process, it has been incremental. It has been um, not everything planned from the start. It was step by step. And, and again, there, um, if you have six, seven years, you could certainly use an extra tool to base your, your, your design and your decision making on. Were you saying that military mobility has been achieved? No, that's work in progress. That's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> we're now seven years after Crimea and we're still working on it. Barely, if you listen to certain, um, Certain observers that I mean that t tell me how you'd work that one out with with your uh, collective strategic analysis because um, you've got people saying that this is really urgent and you know all we need is is uh, you know a, a crisis close to the border to prove that we have failed at this so far. So how would you apply this and, well, and make and move military mobility as fast as it needs to be moved? I'm not going to say that it it completely failed, but because we did this whole process bottom up, we only um, realized at a later stage that this was a building block that we needed that we needed to put in place. Still need so, and, and well, in, in part we've done it, but certainly we're not there yet. And, and again, military mobility in itself has very uh, has a lot of facets. I was responsible for part of that at NATO. So I remember. That's why I thought it was ha harassing you about <laughs> Thank it. Thank you. It's, that's, a, that's, that's something that we have an ability and a capability that we have lost after the Cold War that is not easy to rebuild. Um, but I, I think if you have um, thought through these kind of processes in a structural and methodical way, and you have identified the building blocks that you need to achieve uh, success to achieve the strategy that you have laid out. We didn't have a strategy. We, we started with mo military mobility and all the other building blocks first. And now in 2021, we're going to talk about a strategic concept. Um, then it, it, it might help actually to, to, to get a, a more organized process. Doesn't mean that it's a magic wand that produces overnight capabilities. That's not what it is. Ivanka, apply it to China, because this is a place that NATO is only starting to think about um, joint strategy, uh, and it's not yet considered a crisis. Uh, so th isn't this a perfect example of, of where you might uh, apply this way of thinking? That, 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 is, that is a really good example, and, and um, it aligns with, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example of, of the work that we've been doing at King's looking at uh, gray zone crises in, in Ukraine, where, where you have, um, you know, a, a partner, you have, you know, third, third actors. And, and the, the first problem you see is that NATO um, doesn't have a shared objective um, doesn't have a clear strategic objective for what to do in this type of situation because it's it's not um, uh, it's not a situation that we understand very well. We, it's not an, a situation in which we understand what what the factors are and in, in which we can um, you know effectively combine national interests. And so 
we we used wargaming for for this approach um, to look at you know what what are the potential objectives, uh, what are the potential courses of action, and what what might what outcomes might um, might these produce, and and we found that um, you know it, NATO was was stuck with a bad outcome you know, seeing a crisis escalate, um, but actually had achieved its objectives. You know, if you look at the, the objectives that, that uh, it had set out, um, those, those were actually achieved, but it, it, it still faced an undesirable outcome. So it's, it's a good example of, um, you know, well, we, we need to be better at defining strategic objectives. And it, yeah, what ex what, objectives? What objectives did did NATO say it had in Ukraine, at, at which it achieved? I mean, it's not an ally, so it's not responsible uh, ultimately. But right. um, you've got an ongoing war there, um, and and you know a a pretty strong partner country that's under attack. Right, and in this case, the the scenario posited um, um, an Article Four situation for for NATO that then. Um, um, uh, which raised issues about about equities uh, of, of allies, and um, but you know NATO. I mean, I remember one of the quotes that came out of of um, of the game, uh, which was you know NATO was watching a slowly moving train wreck with with no tools to intervene. Um, so doing this kind of um, analysis, thinking through these potential um, situations and, and courses of action um, has helped us better understand the problem, better think about uh, NATO strategy, um, and, and get toward a more um, evidence-based theory of success for exactly these kinds of, 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 I would say, gray zone problems I mean, not not just that they are um, short of war, but that they're also we're not dealing with a traditional adversary um, that is, um, you know, infringing directly on 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 a NATO allies' territorial interests, for example. But yeah. NATO has been using war gaming. I mean, it has been using war gaming. I I mean, for for years, I can think of you know these these uh, practice situations GMX. that go on yeah exactly for days yeah. um so how is it just that that information is not then integrated into into policy planning and discussion GMX, so the, the yearly um crisis management exercise is basically yeah. tabletop for the NAC to exercise decision making on on basic basically to to go through the routine of asking the military to come up with solutions for immediate problems. It's very important and it could very well fit into this bigger concept. But uh, Ivanka said something very important um, and, and you alluded to it. NATO is not always very clear about what its objectives are. So let me give you two examples. You asked for China. We see China's presence in our part of the world, which is not necessarily military, mostly there. Um, the competition that we that they do is is economic, some cyber, etc., but not a, a direct military threat. What's NATO's objective? We have to think through that. I can I can give you an answer. I think that we should at least make sure that NATO secures the global commons. So the high seas, mar maritime choke points, the Arctic. Uh, space, cyberspace, those kind of things we need to be able to secure and we need to be able to um, uh, compete with China uh, in those areas. So that needs clear strategic objectives, that needs a, a very thorough process of thinking what that entails in terms of what you need, in terms of strategy, in terms of capabilities, in terms of political action, etc. We don't have that. So this tool could help us think through that. Um, a recent other uh, example, I would say, is what we call the South. Uh, NATO is still struggling with what to do with the South. We understand the, the threat or the, or the challenge in the East, which is the big bear from, from the Cold War. 
in the South, we have a myriad of issues and we are still grappling with it. Southern allies want, want NATO to take a position, but what is it exactly that our objective is? I can give you an answer. I think Middle East and North Africa is basically a, an ungoverned space to a large extent. Either parts of, a, of countries like the Sudan or whole countries like Libya. And what does an uh, uh, ungoverned space uh, breed? It's terrorism, um, um, proliferation of mass destruction, uh, weapons of mass destruction, um, migrants trafficking, etc. And what's the objective for NATO? Now, in very simple terms, is that we prevent spillover into the, the, the Euro-Atlantic area. What do you need for that, etc. So this is a very simplified version, but you could apply a rigorous uh, process like what we are proposing to this and perhaps come to better understanding and better conclusions than, than what NATO has produced so far, because it's not entirely clear. And even if you read now the, the report of the reflection group, it's a bit thin on the South, I can tell you. So, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ivanka, sorry. Well, th th thanks, Jerry. Well, I mean, and, and um, some of some of our listeners are are going to hear what what Timo was saying on what we should be do what NATO should be doing with regard to China, and and they won't agree. Um, and so th these are the, the 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 analytical process that we're proposing is is exactly uh, that to be able to capture these kind these different judgments on both what we should be doing. And also how to go about doing it, and and bring them together in a systematic way, so that we can see, uh, you know, which of these uh, objectives and actions would lead to uh, successful what we see as successful outcomes, or which ones are going to take us down a path that that we should avoid. Okay, but um, otherwise you just have to take my solution. <laughs> and, and, and then we go back and we find out that Timo was right all along, but we of have course. the data to, to support that. We already know that. We <laughs> short circuit the whole thing, right? Um, but okay, so to, to sort of try to pull it all back together and wrap up, um, even in your paper, you acknowledge that sometimes it's not only a lack of data or a lack of information. Um, that would make NATO act in a more agile way, in a more logical way, in a more constructive way. I mean, it's force of habit, it's uh, political leverage being, you know, being used on for other issues. I mean, just like any international organization, it's not only the problem at hand that gets uh, brought into the decision making process. So even if you have the, you know, cleanest, leanest decision making, um, uh, mechanism here, it doesn't mean that that allied governments are going to go for it. Um, they might just say, oh, that's very interesting. Thank you very much. And, and, you know, follow their old habits to disagree, or as you say, kick the can down the road. So tell me what you think the likelihood is, um, as you're as you're concluding comments, that, um, that this kind of uh, process will be adapted, will be will be adopted and adapted then? Well, I mean, in a nutshell, what we're proposing is you know, let's add on the strategic thinking layer before the collective decision-making process. Um, I think that that problem is is well acknowledged. Um, there's there's there has been strategic atrophy. Uh, you know, we need to be better at thinking about better under, at thinking about these problems and understanding their their implications. And and what we're saying is, let's bring in some. Um, some new analytical tools. Let's bring in some some new technologies to help enable allies to um, outthink opponents together. So, also, I think it's very important to realize that NATO has come out of a strategic holiday of about twenty years since the Cold War. We've been engaged in what we call discretionary operations, very important, uh, but uh, we are we have not been in the game of collective defense. We have not felt the kind of pressures that we feel today. And if we need to um, face those pressures with a more diverse and heterogeneous uh, alliance as we have now, with higher demands from the US side, because that won't change with President Biden, there will be 
uh, demands from Washington on defense spending, etc., then we better get it right. And um, it's not going to be the panacea that's going to solve everything, for sure. But it's certainly, it, it could be an extra tool that could help uh, come to the right conclusions and come to the right uh, solutions. And so the, my prediction is we're going to do it. I think so. Well, there's never been a better time to try to uh, sort of slip this added procedure in because consultations are back underway. Everybody sounds pretty happy with the level of communication going on uh, across the Atlantic now. So, uh, you know, it makes sense now that there is, again, logical, uh, logical thinking happening in um, military decision decision making. Um, so I, I guess we'll see if it makes it into the strategic concept, right? You can just cut and paste. Well, and, and even, it, it, even if it doesn't end up in the strategic concept, you don't necessarily have to write in me this method into the strategic concept. NATO, the NAC can, in principle, decide tomorrow to start working on, on these kind of methods. And can, can the Secretary General can uh, basically start an Office of Net Assessment tomorrow. That's a bit simplified, but, but you don't necessarily have to wait for a strategic concept to start using these kind of tools. Well, maybe you need to come out of retirement, Timo, and get back up there and start uh, <laughs> spread <Well>. it around. <laughs> All right, well, I'd, I'd very much like to thank both of you, Ivanka Barzashka and Ambassador Timo Koster for sharing your recommendation to revitalize NATO's grand strategy. And you can find all 20 ideas at atlanticcouncil.org and tell us what you think on Twitter at hashtag StrongerWithAllies. Thanks so much for being here and join me next time.